Hi, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Rockville and Gaithersburg and delighted to be hosting a series on Kibitzing with Kagan, featuring each of the nine Democratic candidates for governor. With me today is my wonderful friend and former House colleague, Rashern Baker. Rashern, welcome and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with me today. Oh, Cheryl, I, it's a pleasure to be here. It's great to see you. It's great to be part of your podcast, which I've looked through and they're great. Thank you so much. So Rashern, County Executive Baker, uh, <laughs> we are gonna start by giving you 60 seconds to talk about your background and why you're running for governor. You may begin. Okay, uh, my background is I grew up in the military. My dad did 30 years in the military. So I've lived all over the United States. Uh, ended up coming to the Washington area to go to Howard. Uh, moved to Prince George's County, was elected to the House of Delegates and then uh, County Executive. And I'm running because I think Maryland can do better than what we're doing now. That was pretty concise. Awesome. Okay. Um, <laughs> I have, I have timers set all over the place. Okay, so we're going to start with a million quick questions. And the first category is about your childhood. You referenced okay. that you um, grew up in the military. Uh, can you say where you grew up, some or all of the key places that you uh, grew up? Sure. I was born in Valdosta, Georgia. Um, spent most of my childhood in Fort Bragg, uh, North Carolina, and then Springfield, Massachusetts, when my father did his tours in Vietnam. Uh, my teenage years were spent in Okinawa, Japan, and I went to a high school, a middle school, and a junior high, and uh, we ended up in Beverly, Mass., and then finally in Springfield, Mass. Wow. Did you have a pet ever growing up? Yes. We had um, two dogs, which was unusual. We had one in Okinawa, um, and then a final one when I was about to go off to college in Springfield, Massachusetts, so dogs were our pets. Great. Were you a good student? I was not a good student. Um, in fact, one of the stories that I tell people is that, you know, I repeated the first and second grade. And so I had a lot of trouble as a young um, child. And, um, but later on in life, I had these great parents that helped me get over that. So no. Good for you. Who is your favorite teacher and why? Oh God, my, well, I'm gonna give you two. One was Miss Lutz who was my 10th grade teacher in Beverly, Massachusetts. And she's the first person that introduced me to um, Richard Wright. And it was a school where there were no black kids, no kids of color, but myself. Mm -hmm. And she opened that door to me and it started my journey on reading. And the other was Art Barnes, um, who was the teacher in classical, uh, classical high school in Springfield, who's the one that recognized that I could actually do more than what I thought I could do and gave me a leadership position um, that started me on my way to college and into elective office. Fantastic. What was your favorite TV show as a kid? Oh, um, well, Batman okay. <laughs> for what was that. And um, uh, that probably was anything to do with, with superheroes. Okay. Uh, what was your earliest career fantasy? What did you think you wanted to be when you grew up? Oh, God. Uh, without a football player. Football player. I, right. I was going to be a play? professional player. I did. I played in high school. Um, I was good. Uh, I didn't grow past five, eight and a half, and I weighed 145 pounds. So. <laughs> Not so much your future then. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, who was your mentor when you were young? Okay. Um, my father and mother, really my, my, my dad was the person I looked up to. Um, he was an airborne uh, ranger and Green Beret and just a fair and decent individual, but my, my parents. Nice, you have siblings and where are you in the birth order? I am what we call the middle child, but I have an older brother um, and I have a younger brother and a younger sister. All right. We're gonna to shift to hobbies. Uh, so you already referenced football, so maybe that's your answer, but I was gonna ask, what's your favorite sport to play or watch? My favorite sport to play is tennis. Mm -hmm. My favorite sport to watch is football. <laughs> okay, who do you root for? Uh, yeah. <laughs> the team that shall not be named? 
the team, the team that shall not be named, but it's probably not the way you're thinking of. Oh. Um, for the Patriots. <laughs> Patriots. Okay, as long as you didn't say Cowboys, we're all right. <laughs> all right. Um, did you pick up any new hobby during COVID? Um, yes, I did actually. Um, and it's watching um, legal uh, television series. I don't watch a lot of TV. And during COVID, my wife and I were watching Law and Order and some other shows, which I had never seen before. Okay. Uh, other than this podcast, which is obviously your favorite, what a, do you have another favorite podcast? Anything you'd recommend to folks? You know, my kids got me on, uh, what is it, Serial, where they, there's one of those podcasts when they're doing that. So uh, the time during, just before COVID, when we were trying to do a lot of family stuff, uh, yeah, my my young adults are big in the podcast, so they got me on that one. Nice. Uh, any show, well, you've mentioned Law & Order. Uh, any other TV show that you've binged recently? Um, gosh, that's a good question. Uh, I do a lot of British television, so... Uh, a lot of what television? Uh, British TV. British. I heard yeah. religious. Okay, British. Uh -huh. British TV. Um, and and some of The Crown or Downton Abbey or... I, I did Downton Abbey. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so that that's what um i have so never that. once watched that i am definitely a weirdo that way oh. yeah oh good no it's it's addictive okay it's addictive. all right well let's pivot to the arts more formally what is your favorite genre of music um I really i i love all kinds but i listen to classic uh classical music um rock r and b uh a little jazz, but not much, and uh, reggae. Bob Marley is my favorite. Fun, fun. What do you have a favorite song or anthem that lifts you up and inspires you? Right it, at the moment, it's uh, this gospel uh, singer uh, uh, Tisha Cobbs, um, and uh, her music is just inspirational. I was playing it yesterday, nice. uh, just for an event, uh, but really. Um, one of the songs I played during my time as county executive was uh, Break Every Chain. Hmm. So symbolic and important. Yeah. Uh, what is your favorite arts venue? Uh, uh, arts venue? Yeah. To go see music or theater or anything? Um, you know, mostly here in the county. So if MGM has a really great mm -hmm. um, music venue uh, that, that I just love. It's small, it's intimate. Um, and so that's probably the one, uh, you know, it, I went to the, uh, to, uh, uh FedEx field uh -huh. during as county executive. So I saw you two there. So that was great. Nice. Uh, nice. so yes. So I got to see Cher at MGM, uh, <sighs> which I decided was kind of a bucket list thing. Cause I think she's amazing. She um, is. Amazing. Yeah. Um, as someone who used to have a radio show on Broadway musicals, Tell me uh, a few of and up to five of your top favorite uh, Broadway musicals. Oh, well, of course, Hamilton. Uh -huh. uh, I, I loved it before the book. Um, Rent, uh, because it's my, my kid's favorite. Um, can't think of any others. You know, my wife was the person that took them to musicals. On Broadway. I was left home. <laughs> Either left out or off the hook, whichever way. Uh, exactly. <laughs> um, is there a book that has had a meaningful impact on your life? Oh, God, yeah. Uh, Richard Wright, Black Boy. Without a doubt, anybody who's known me longer than a day and heard a speech knows how. That changed my life completely. Mm -hmm. um, but that that is it. Great. We're going to shift to personal. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the biggest risk you've ever taken? Oh God. Um, I think the biggest risk that I've ever taken was first running for office mm -hmm. uh, because it had been a dream of mine to go into public service. And when you first do, when you do it for the first time, you feel like, oh my God, if I don't make this, then my career goals are over. Cause I had no plan B. Right. That was plan A, B, and C. And you're talking about your 1994 race for the house. 1994 of race for uh, house of delegates. Yep. Okay. Um, have you ever broken a bone? And if so, how? Oh, God. 
I have not. Now I'm going to break a bone because you're okay. Asking. Knock wood. No. <laughs> so let's keep that as never. Um, what is your favorite gadget? Your favorite technology? And uh, I should say, not counting your phone because that's too easy. Oh, uh, yeah. That was like the only one I know. Uh, you know, yeah. the, the iPad. Okay. You know, the iPad. You know, as county executive, you'll get to use technology that much. Okay. Um, do you speak any other language or languages other than English? No, and I'm so mad because I should have learned Japanese when I was over there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, at least you can order sushi a bit. So I love sushi. I know, me too. Um, what was your first car and how old were you when you got it? Uh, it was a Datsun B210 stick shift and it was right after I graduated from undergrad. So 1982. Nice, nice. Uh, what color was it? It was silver. I mean, I'm sorry, it was gold. gold. And as an Omega, uh, I really like that. Nice. Um, tell us about your first crush or your first love. Oh, uh, so my first love was uh, when I got to Howard University and I dated for a small, a, a short time, a girl from Houston, Texas. And I loved her. I thought she, I was going to marry her. And my wife always cries when I tell her the story about how she broke up with me, Aww. you know, the girlfriend. So, yes. Okay. Um, tell me something important that you learned from one of your parents. Okay. From, um, I would say from my mom, you know, my mom never graduated from high school. Um, she worked really hard and she's the person that actually made me the human that I am now and, um, you know, how to respect people, um, how to hold my temper. Mm. Um, so she's been the biggest influence even today on, on my life outside of my wife. Nice. Um, before we go to the next category, what ticks you off the most? Um, your skin. What really gets on my skin is, is, you know, folks who don't keep their word and and don't have a sense of urgency if they're in public service or anything i'm impatient okay so at home uh county executive baker richard what is your favorite junk food <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> cookies cookie any particular kind a uh, chocolate chip okay do you make them i do not make them my daughters make them okay and them for making it okay what is your least favorite food something you really just won't eat oh, that's a good one um uh it, considering i don't eat red meat so i won't include that but um you know um sauerkraut okay what do you cook especially well rice and beans okay uh, what is your least favorite household chore? That's a good one. Um, really, I don't have a least favorite household chore because we had to do a lot of chores when I was growing up. So I don't, um, I don't have a problem. I love housework. Okay, look at you. Um, <laughs> God forbid your house is on fire. Other than people or pets, what would you want to rescue and try to, re try to save? Um, all of my kids' paintings that they've done, uh -huh. which would be really hard because they're big, but yes, I, I would, I would die, you know. Nice. We're going to shift to travel. Uh, yeah. What is the best vacation you've ever taken and where was that? Uh, the best vacation I've ever gone to was um, when the kids and I went to Dominican Republic. Nice. We've been on a lot of <laughs> What is the favorite Maryland place that you've discovered recently on the campaign trail, perhaps? Um, you know, a nice place to eat in Frederick. You know, I've gone up there before and I've run the marathon, but I've, we've discovered some nice little restaurants up there that I love. Nice. And I was going to ask you, what's your favorite Maryland bar or restaurant? Is there any one that jumps out for you? Uh. No, as long as they're in National Harbor, they're my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> All about economic development in the home county. Exactly. 
If neither COVID nor money were an object, where would you want to travel in the world? Oh, Shanghai. Okay. I've been to Shanghai, but I'd love to take my, my daughters who haven't been. Nice. It's one of my favorite places in the world. Nice. What do you like about it? It's just, it's the, it's walkable. It's New York, but cleaner. Mm -hmm. And the people were really nice. And, you know, it's just, it was just a great place to venture out to. So I really love Shanghai. Nice. What is something you always bring with you when you travel? A book. Okay. Whatever you're reading. Okay. No matter what, I have a book. Great. Uh, shifting to the category of social media. What, what percentage of Facebook posts or tweets are done by you? Um, now more so than ever. I never did them uh, before I, when I was county executive. Um, so now I would say maybe about, um, and this is going to be a shame, it's maybe about uh, 50, 60% are done by me. Okay. Not yeah. much. I'm not as good. I'm learning. Okay. Good for you. We all need to learn. Uh, right. Which is your favorite social media uh, platform and why? Uh, Facebook, because uh, people of my generation are on there. Right. <laughs> I.e. I old people, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Anything my kids say they've done with uh, that I know, that's probably good for me. Right, <laughs> right. I'm waiting for one of the candidates to say Twitch or something, and I <laughs> don't even know what that is. <laughs> um, we're sure we're going to shift to politics. Mm -hmm. Why are you a Democrat? Oh, you know, I'm, I'm a Democrat because when you look at, you know, as a, you know, as a history major at Howard, so I've studied politics and I actually worked for the Republican Party when I was in high school just to get a feel for what everything is like. And to me, the, the party that was the most diverse, and most inclusive um, and offered the best chance for the Democratic Party. So it was, you know, uh, it was Mario Cuomo for me. I know it's Kennedy for other generations, but for me, Mario Cuomo in 1984 just solidified it. I was going to be active in the Democratic Party. Up until that point, I had been an independent. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, has any Democratic leader or has the Democratic Party ever surprised or disappointed you? Um, yeah, I think the Democratic Party at times has disappointed me. Um, I look at some of the races where I thought, you know, whether it was um, Bradley in, in California who loses a gubernatorial race, or Tom even Bradley. when Doug, Not Bill Tom, Bradley. Tom Bradley, Bradley uh, in, in California, yeah. but even when Doug Wilder became the lieutenant governor, not the governor, lieutenant governor of Virginia, Virginia um, it was disappointing how hard it was for somebody who had done everything people asked him to do. Mm -hmm. So both of those are African-American candidates, so not as welcoming and inclusive. I mean, do you want to say something more about why those are yeah. two examples for you? Yeah, I mean, not as welcoming and inclusive in the Democratic Party if we want. Um, certainly in the 60s, if you look at, you know, um, what was going on with the, with the Freedom Party from Mississippi mm -hmm. or Shirley Chisholm mm -hmm. when she ran. I mean, it was just, she was a boss. Yeah. And to not get the respect um, that I thought she should have gotten um, Hillary Clinton, you know, to this day, that's probably, that's probably my number one. The most disappointing thing of the Democratic Party and the nation is Hillary Clinton. There's no one more qualified to be president. And it hurt. It, it was hard to explain to my kids. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard for all of us still. Yeah. Uh, do you want to talk about George Floyd, Freddie Gray? Do you want to talk briefly about Black Lives Matter and, sure. that and what that's been for you? Uh, yeah, it, it has been, um, while those events are really, you know, gut-wrenching, um, they did something that I think my wife and I worried about uh, our children, and that is when you have children who grow up in Prince George's County, which is majority African-American, uh, their friends and cousins and, you know, and folks like that all coming from parent, from families that they're doctors, lawyers, dentists, professionals, all this stuff. You wonder whether they understand what the struggle in this country is about and whether they get it. Mm -hmm. And what I saw from the uprising was 
my young adults understanding in a very profound way differently than me on why it was so important to go out in the street and to, and to not just protest, but to take it one step further like their mother always did, which was to write, advocate, and not give up. And so I think seeing that profound change across the world and the impact it had on the very people that I look to to lead uh, this nation um, was both the good and bad part uh, that came out of it. So it was really, it was hard, hard to explain and, but gratifying to see so many young people. Yes. When did you first think about running for office? How old were you and what, what made you think about that? I was 17 years old and it was Richard Wright. Okay. I, I read okay. Black Boy. Yeah. And for the first time, I understood that my upbringing was a lot different than mm. anybody else's. I took for granted that the fact that if I messed up in school or did anything wrong, that my parents were always there. They saved for my college fund. Um, and it made me feel guilty that here I am with all these opportunities and not taking advantage of it. And I wanted to do something different. This is a longer answer, but um, my dad was so happy I focused on something other than football that he and I would watch political events. And we were watching a candidate in, um, in Massachusetts. I was complaining about the guy, how he's a bum. You know, 20 years he's been in there, nothing's changed. And my father said, if you can do better, you should run. Wow. And, and I said, I'm going to run for office. So That's I know the date. You never wavered between 17 and when you... Never. never. It, it, is, it is one of those things that everything that I did was based on the fact that how can I better myself to finally get in there and to prove to my father uh, that you can hold on to your dignity yes. and make tough decisions. Yes. And so one of the greatest moments is my, in my life um, is that he got a chance to see me in the Maryland House of Delegates on the floor before he passed away. Nice, nice, that's beautiful. Um, on a scale of one to 100, with one being the very, very most conservative right wing and 100 being the very, very most liberal left wing, where, what number would you say represents your political philosophy? Um, well, <laughs> according to me, I would probably be, you know, at 75 <laughs> going toward the left. Okay. Um, according to my kids, I probably would be at 65 or 55. <laughs> okay. All right. According to your campaign manager, what does, uh, what does he or she think you are or should be? Uh, what, what they think I am, because for me, it's, it, they've realized they can't change me. I'm going to be who I am. Right. I think, they, I think because they're young, they probably put me at 65. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's fair because once you've been in office and you understand practical politics, um, you know, you, you know why that is. One day when we do this podcast again, I'll, you could ask me about the guy that I thought was a bum when I was 17 years I, old. I would love to hear more about that or over a beer or something. Yes. Um, who are some of your sheroes and heroes, living or dead? You've referenced several people, but anyone else you want to reference here? Um, you know, my wife, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the most amazing individual I've ever met. Um, even if she wasn't my wife, she would be one of my top heroes just to see how she advocates. Mm -hmm. um, certainly her, you know, my mom. Um, you know, uh, the, my, you know, my first boss, uh, you know, from our real job, uh, Andre Gandhi, who ran a nonprofit that I worked for for 10 years, taught me everything I needed to know about what it's like to run, um, you know, a nonprofit and a large nonprofit and what leadership is and management is. Um, I tease my kids because I tell them I've never had a male boss. Hmm. All my bosses have been, have been women. And, but that one, Andre Gandhi, I learned the most from. Nice. Well, never having had a male boss or only having women bosses makes you, makes you super smart, right? <laughs> yes. Um, take one minute, please, and give a pitch for a nonprofit organization that you support personally. Which organization and what do they do? Uh, the Alzheimer's Association. And they work toward... 
a day when we won't have people with Alzheimer's. It's a personal one. I wear the, uh, a, 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 a tattoo on my arm with it, but the most amazing work that I've ever seen, uh, they've not only helped my family, but millions of families. So that's my favorite. That's fantastic. If there were a windfall of federal funds that would come in and that you were the only decision maker as governor and you didn't have to deal with the legislature, where would you put that money and why? Um, I put it in K through 12 education and maybe maybe K through 14, mm -hmm. uh, K through 12 and then community college. And the reason is uh, education is the thing that will change the dynamics for everyone. If you can get children started with a quality public education, um, then it will change everything. Do you wanna say about how you think the Kerwin Blueprint plan uh, starts that process? Does it accomplish it? You think it needs more? Just anything you wanna say about that? No, I think, I think it is a great, it's a great start. It, it spells out what probably what we've known for all along. And that is, you know, public education is very important, but you have to have the resources in there that and so I think the work done in the current uh, blueprint is what we need to make not just Maryland better but make the nation better so I'm a big supporter of it and that's why I would give them my money. That's great. So Rashern Baker you know that this is the one question that I ask everyone at the end of my podcast which is I want to know what your secret hidden superpower is. What is one thing you're really good at that most folks can't do? Oh gosh, um, I saw I saw the answers, and I'm like, okay. Uh, the 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 young man's secret power was superpower was uh, your 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 first guess was the best. Kevin you know, Othell, he was amazing. Yeah, he is literally amazing. Yeah, you know, I think it's I think it's my ability to. Um, to relate to any kind of person that's walking around. I think growing up in the military, you had to learn to adapt. So I've been in situations and I think that's it. You know, I can get, go to any place and feel comfortable. I've never felt uncomfortable because I've learned how to adapt. When you move every two years, you do that. And I think that's my secret power. My kids say I'm friendly. I like everybody, you know, and I do. I, there's very few people I don't like. Now, let me not like me, but I like them. That's awesome. So we still have a few minutes, so I'm going to do two things. Uh, first off, do you have any regrets that you'd like to share? Yeah, I think, you know, um, one of the biggest regrets that I have is, you know, when you're younger, you think that everything you know is absolutely gospel. And there were things my dad would say to me that I would just be like, you don't know what you're talking about, mm -hmm. you know. And now that I have young adults of my own, I look back and I was like, I wish I could go back and apologize to him for the number of times that I've made him worry. Mm. Um, and I think that's where we're getting. And my mom, I, I will never get over the fact, and this is what makes me, you know, I think dri drives me as a public servant, is, you know, my mom was, in her, it was a teenage mom with two kids and a husband who was in the military. And so basically she raised us. Yeah. And I was a really, really bad child. Mm. And just the thought of her having to deal with four kids and her middle, her middle child, older son, uh, second oldest child, getting in so much trouble. Um, just, you know, it's one of the things that, that I will always regret. Mm. Okay. Um, briefly, you've referred to your beautiful kids multiple times. Give us the quick overview. How many, how old, where do they live? But we have a minute and a half. Okay. So uh, Rashern the Fourth it lives in Riverdale. He's an artist. He's a painter, a phenomenal artist. Uh, Asia Baker, who I delivered in a wow. car on the highway, um, is a third year, third year student, law student at Howard University. And Quincy Baker is, the, is getting her master's at Yale in fine arts. She's an artist too. So uh, they live in, uh, in Prince George's County when they're not pressing up to New York, uh, but they're amazing, amazing individuals and they reflect their mother. <laughs> well, I'm not going to argue with you on that. Uh, 
in the last few seconds, is there anything I haven't asked you about that you would like to share here? Um, yes, how great it is to be on your podcast. And I really mean that because <laughs> you have, you know, you have kept your principles from the day I met you. And it reflects that. And, and it's so great to see. It. And I know you're an inspiration um, to, uh, to folks out there. So thank you for being you, Cheryl. Thank you. Suddenly we have lots more time for you to talk about that. <laughs> no, we are, we are out of time, but um, we're Sharon Baker. Thank you so much for taking the time to kibitz. It was great to um, be able to ask you a whole bunch of random questions to let folks get to know you better. So I appreciate your, your joining me on this journey of a kibitz. Well, thank you. Wishing you the best of luck personally and professionally. And I look forward to seeing you in person very soon. Oh, thank you, Cheryl. I appreciate it. Take care, huh? <laughs>